Namaskar everyone and welcome to Daisy Talk. If you are on right now and you recognize the song, definitely put it in the chat. So I am Srishti Brabha, the managing editor at India Currents. And I'm going to add my co-host. Uh, let's see. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> hey, Ashu. Hey. You recognize my song? <laughs> yes, I love this song. And you know, it's just, I'm going to share a little cute story about it, too. Okay. But wait, what is happening? Okay. Okay, I figured it out. And boom! Oh, boom! Mm -hmm. That was a reveal. <laughs> nice. You're looking Hi. beautiful. I love your earrings. Listen, I'm earring lady, but now I think I just found a competition. I think you're my earring lady competition. I know you said you were earring lady, but I got lots of earrings. <laughs> I got I'm lots and lots that. of earrings. <laughs> I'm seeing that every time. Do you get yours from India or do you get them? You yeah, buy them here. I think these. So I actually get them like as hand me downs, or I got them in India, or yeah, mainly that. So this is a hand me down. I got it from my aunt. I'm pretty sure she like probably got it in India or had it from a long time ago. And then she told me like it was too heavy for her lobes. So she gave it to me and I was like, Oh my God, I feel myself in these earrings. Um, yeah. let me stop this song. Um, so let's start. Uh, Namaskar everyone. Welcome to Desi Talk. I'm your host, Srishti Prabha, the managing editor of India Currents. And before I introduce my co-host, I just want to say that right now India Currents is running a fundraising campaign until December 31st. And Newsmatch, which is like an independent organization, will match any donations given to India Currents. So if you have even $5, it does not matter. Please donate to India Currents um, to sustain like this kind of work that we do to pay Yashu, to pay me, all of that. Um, it would be great. So yeah, again, you can go to... Um, if you go to India Currents website and click on the donate button, or if you go to our Instagram and click on any of the uh, posts about donations on our link in bio, that should take you to the pay B donation page and any donations you make will be doubled. So support your community media. So here with me, we have my co-host. Hey, what's up everyone? Be sure to donate. Okay, what goes around comes around. All right. <laughs> My name is Yashu Rao, plus model and confidence coach, and of course, the co-host for Daisy Talk, coming to you guys live every Tuesday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, and today we are continuing the conversation, but before that, we played a song at the introduction of today's live. Anyone know what the song may be? Go ahead and drop it in the comments below. If you get it right, I'll play it again. <laughs> That's it. That's all you get. Now figure it out. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I like I like the vibe. Um, I, I love this it. song. I know, me too. I play it on every road trip. So what was your little story? Tell me. Yes. So once what I did was, I for those of you who may know or may not know, um, I love cars. I love cars. I love, like, the makes of cars. I like to do it, it, research on their engines. Like, I like cars. I love driving. So... I have like a list of cars that I want to drive and whatnot. So I remember when I came here to Gainesville, I had once rented a Mustang convertible. Ooh, and okay. Now, although I love cars and all of that, I'm also really scared to like mess something up. So like if I press this button and like shit goes down, like, I'd be like, oh my gosh. So mm. I just never ended up opening the convertible part of it and just like <laughs> drove it like a normal car. Oh my and god. Like, three hours. Like, I went all the way to Tampa, and then I drove back. Like, I didn't go to the beach. I didn't do nothing. I literally just drove the car jamming to music. And then I come home, and, and I'm like, hey, guys, to my brothers. I was like, y'all want to drive with me? Like, yeah, we could do that. So then one of my brothers, he's, like, about pe pushing every button. He, pu he gets in there, he pushes a button, and then, boom, it's a convertible. And then we're like, oh, okay, now we really got to go for a drive. 
So then we decided to take another drive, and then we decided to collectively play this song, which Trishy will announce shortly, um, because it's kind of like that road trip song. And then we took a video, and we're all kind of like going, and we're like bobbing our heads to the beat, and we're all just like feeling yeah, the vibe. The feet, the feet out the window. That's like the, yeah. I, I just remember, that is, that was my favorite song, movie, everything. And if you watched our live last week, then you'll know which movie I'm talking about. But we'll tell it you at the end. So I guess our live did not upload. So we're going to give a short recap of a little bit of the stuff that we talked about. And then we'll introduce our guest for today. And I'm actually very, very pumped because I think it's always good to hear from like, the new generation what's cool what's popping because i don't know it anymore so um we're gonna get some good insights into like what do we think about south asians and media and representation and cinema and hollywood and bollywood and all the things so yeshu do you want to start with like a little bit of the recap from last week absolutely so last week we went ahead and talked about our favorite classic movies from the Desi industries. So we talked about Bollywood, Kaliwood, Tollywood, and we talked about not only some of the, the feeling good, you know, the feel good movies, but we also talked about the style of Desi cinema and how it is so different. Uh, not to mention the fact that people consider Desi films as musicals. And then we also talked about some of the, interesting concepts that are discussed in Daisy films and then also the masala films as well as controversial topics that being Indian American or Daisy American we may have disagreement with and I'll let mm -hmm. Sushi cover the that part of it like what are some of the controversial topics that we talked about that we see in Bollywood movies and uh, other Daisy yeah. movies I think we'll probably end up talking a little bit about this today as well from what I know about our uh, guest. But we talked a little about sexism, rape culture, um, inaccuracies. Like, I think we talked about Slumdog Millionaire. And though the book is written by a South Asian person, the film was made by a British white person. <laughs> so how accurate was it to our to our people? And, like, I know most Indian people I knew really didn't enjoy the film. Um, and so that being the thing that everyone brings up when you tell them that you're Indian is slumdog millionaire is very frustrating. And I really like that we also discussed um, like that, you know, we have these other industries. It's not just Bollywood. And, you know, you've grown up on Tollywood and Kaliwood, which is Kannada films, Telugu films, Tamil films. And I really didn't because I spoke Hindi. So I really grew up on Bollywood. That was like what I knew. Um, but there are these, like, really indie spaces for, um, you know, they see films. And I actually mentioned, and I'll mention it again, that their Third Eye Film Festival actually started today. And it is a fully South Asian film festival based out of SF. Usually it's actually in person, but this year it's online. Um, but India Sweets and Spices, which is, like, gaining a lot of global uh, fame, well, you know, like, they're playing that, they're playing that movie and, like, if you're interested in Desi films and representation, more of the indie genres of, of Indian things and Desi things, this is a great way to, to go and, you know, like expose yourself to other things. Cause I hear a lot of generalizations even about Desi um, cinemas, right? Like, I don't want to get too into it, but even just like, you know, like people will say, well, there's not a lot of, uh, we, they don't really talk a lot about uh, LGBTQ things. They don't talk a lot about, you know, um, you know, anything like feminism or independence or like, you know, like all these different things, but actually these things exist in like a subculture and like what we're really seeing in like the mainstream media, it's like anywhere in the world, it's a little bit less nuanced. Hi, Simon. So oh, and Monita, and I think Monita's here. She actually did uh, the review for India Sweets and Spices for us. So follow her if you're interested. Go ahead, Yeshu. <laughs> And I was going to say shout out to Sakib, who is in our current situation, Keep Photo Photography. Uh, mm -hmm. Sakib is a filmmaker um, and video uh, on the videographer, the technical side, audio and visuals is what he does for the film industry. And so mm -hmm. being a Desi um, person and being integrated into non-Desi film and working a lot with 
um, different kinds of American genres. I know he's got great perspective. So definitely check his page out as well. He talks about a lot of his work, working in American film, but then also being a Bangladeshi, how that kind of impacts his journey as well. So definitely check out his page. I just saw he popped in. So wanted to give a shout out. Awesome. So with that, we're going to bring on our guest for today. Her name is Medha Sarkar. She's actually an India Currents intern. And she has a very nuanced perspective on South Asian representation in media. And she knows a lot of the things that we're talking about exist. I think it'll be good to go through some of those things with her. She's also a freshman in high school. So when she's talking, just remember, she's very young, but actually she sounds like an adult. <laughs> I forget sometimes myself that she's really young, but she has like a good, you know, we need to learn from the Gen Z's. Like, what are they thinking about? Maybe there are things that we aren't thinking about and how can we start to be more inclusive of those things? So let me bring on Madeha. And I'm super excited that we're getting this Gen Z perspective because um, I know over generations, the value and then the way that, the cinema has progressed is very different. So, you know, just kind of to give you guys perspective. Hey, Mesa. When my mom... <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hey, Mesa. Yeah, go ahead. What did your mom say? <laughs> Sorry. So, like, my mom's generation, you know, they're like, old is gold. And they always, you know, they love the story, the movie lines that existed during their time. And then you progress a little bit more to my gener the generation a little bit older than I and for them they were so involved into Bollywood even in the South Indian culture uh, South Indian part you know very much into Bollywood and then my you know age group came in and we completely loved our South Indian films Hollywood and Hollywood and then now, you know, you're gonna, we, we have an amazing Gen Z person here. So, you know, getting their perspective. And so through time, we're going to see these changes in the way cinema is not only progressed or developed the storylines and everything, but also just how much we relate to movies. I know movies played a huge, huge role in the culture when my mom was growing up. And so yeah. now how that plays Definitely. a part. Yeah, I think it really has played a role in all of our lives, whether we like to admit it or not. And um, I mean, Maeda, you can comment on this because like, I know that the films that I like were so different to then like what basically, Yashu, what you're saying, my, what my, my parents like. So do you see that kind of change even with your parents um, with what they enjoy watching, what you enjoy watching? Well, with my parents, I think they're kind of an outlier because recently they've gone into like modern, like sort of realistic Indian films, mm -hmm. like sort of portraying like all like all these like tough issues in India, like the caste system and um, sexism in India, transphobia in India and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's my mom and my dad. They every night when they go to sleep, well, before they go to sleep, mm -hmm. Netflix, Indian movies for an hour and so that's it only so an that, hour in Indian movies way longer than an hour no no it's an hour for my mom because she falls asleep by an hour and then it's like two hours for my dad so are you watching with them what are you watching right now I sort of like I may maybe drop in sometimes and sometimes I just like sit by them doing homework and then I'll hear some dialogue and I'm like what is the context for that? <laughs> just like, just like randomly, like I want to kill you and your entire family, and I'm just like, what the? What are you watching, guys? And yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I actually just because this is relevant, I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna say this. I watched um, Surya Vanshi <laughs> last week, which is like I don't know if you know this is a total masala film. It's like a cop, like it's a trilogy so there was Singham, which everyone knows with Ajay Devgan then there was Simba which had Ranveer Singh and then this third one which is um Akshay Kumar and the one thing that I the theme through all of this and it's actually interesting just to talk about the narrative difference is like in India right now they're really going heavy on like cops they're saying like cops are vigilante justice like they're patriots, they do this, they do that, they help the community. And I know a lot of it has to do with like the level of chaos in, um, in India, and they like have to enforce law. So they're trying to build this like theme of like, law enforcement is good. And then here, we see the ac ac actual opposite where like, 
obviously police aren't considered like a a good like not people might have different opinions but there's a lot of black lives matter movements we don't necessarily agree with police like their police brutality and things like that so are you seeing also like theme thematic differences in what they're talking about um when you're like sli- like slightly listening on the side or if you're watching a movie or you're listening to something like what are you seeing I guess I'm seeing in a lot of Hindi movies and this like recently there have been a lot of cop movies about like this just like cop who's like sacrificing everything um to like protect his country and just stuff about like the military especially has been mm-hmm. like a topic that's been recurring throughout what I've heard of my mom and dad's Netflix uh <laughs> sessions <laughs> but I it's sometimes so obvious that they're like trying to address the issues with police and everything. But at the same time, the protagonist who's always like a police officer or like a soldier has to always be the protagonist. Like they can't do anything wrong to make them not be the protagonist. Mm -hmm. And so they're like that one nice guy. Like everybody talks about in America during the black lives matter movement, like not all cops are bad. And it's, in India, it's kind of portrayed as, like, the one good cop. It's mm. always the protagonist. And it's through their lens that's, like, oh, I did this for good reasons, and now there are bad people out there. When when you're a part of that system, you're already mm. participating in all the bad stuff that's there, and you have to acknowledge that your contributing may have some bad effects. Mm. And I think okay. it's also important, you know, kind of to touch on that, um, that, that I feel they see film very often concentrates on that one person being the hero. And then, of course, a heroine Mm -hmm. is always the counterpart there. But this is a constant kind of um, conversation versus, I think, even if it's like a more general topic like police brutality or whatever, um, we don't see it as like kind of like, hey, the, this is what happened with that group of people or this is what's happening with this whole system. It's always narrated towards it's, that one very specific that character. That is very true, yeah. But with that also being said, recently there had been a South Indian film featuring Surya called J Beam that had um, released and it talks about police brutality in India. And Mm. I thought it was just so interesting that the movie came out this year. um, And I just felt like, you know, a lot of it talks about the, like the, the awful things that happen in police uh, situations like custody or whatever in India. And so I felt like during this time of like BLM and everything going on here, um, definitely felt like the Indian crowd might have jumped on that topic to, to pull out a movie that was similar. But again, you see, it's not talking about the topic as a whole, but it's like that one lawyer who is Surya is the guy who is the best. Yeah. And like no one else talks about it. If that yeah. makes sense. Mm-hmm. I also see that a lot with like stories about sexual assault or yes. stories about rape. Mm-hmm. It's always the one lawyer who's defending them. And there, there are so many times I want to hear from the stories of like a woman there and it, and like, or somebody who has to live through that. But a lot of the times, just a male lawyer who like had no idea this was going on and is now learning so much for his character. And now he's a better person at the end of it. Mm-hmm. But by doing that, you're talking about this character's development and not the entire theme that we're trying to touch on in the movie. Mm-hmm. Oh. She'll come um, back. She'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's so many times where it's like, the character says some stuff which I'm like, you need to know more than that to be a lawyer for rape or a lawyer for sexual assault. And the fact that we're giving these like lawyer sort of things, mm-hmm. like this, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, no, I but, feel you. I think it's like the way that they talk about it is so uh like narrow and I also find that they always I mean we talked about this a little bit last time is they take it so far it's so extreme like they'll always start with a good idea and then it'll end somewhere that you never expected for it to go but they're trying to hit every point right like if you're talking about sexual assault yes there's like intersectionality that um goes with it but I don't know what's going on with Yashu. I'm trying to figure it out. (laughs) (laughs) 
Let's see. One second, guys. Uh, I don't know. Yeshu, if you're here, let me know what you, if she can add, if I can add her. But anyway, so like they always go a little oh, bit too there. far. So if you're talking about sexual assault, oh, hey, there you are. <laughs> okay. So we're just talking about like how extreme like some of these Daisy films can be. Like I I think I mentioned on the last live I watched this one film on like uh feminism and 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 it was like it started off so beautifully and basically they they were trying to talk about like LGBTQ issues and women experiencing like you know backlash in different industries like music and all this and then it ended with like rape and murder like the women murdered the guy and that's like vigilante justice they wanted to make sure that he and all this other all these other things showed up and i was like you have such a good idea and it could have gotten the point across if you hadn't just gone like all the way with that um but with that let's start talking about a little bit about like representation so what does representation look like for you uh Maytha? Well, representation for me is sort of doing a character justice to the point where it's not just about inclusion in the film. It's about a character's story that's fully developed and it's showing what a person of that background, of that like sort of um, community, in like a sort of community, what their experiences could have been like. Mm -hmm. And that's representation for me. When you if you're like exactly like that character and you look at that, they're like, yeah, I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. oh. And I and do like you see really that. Do you see that for yourself in like media right now? Not really. No, mm -hmm. it's, it's gotten better from like the two thousands, but, mm -hmm. or the 2010s, but it's still trying to gain its footing, especially with uh, Indian American um, representation. Like a lot, there has been a lot of other progress. Like, I don't know if you heard, but I think it was like Sesame Street introduced like a, the first Asian American puppet like yesterday or today. Mm -hmm. um, and th I know they're trying, but we need to get to a point where trying's not good enough. You actually have to do the representation well enough. Mm -hmm. And I want to say a couple of things on this too, right? Like representation and then kind of look at it from the other perspective too. And me and Sushi had been talking about this a little earlier, but you know, even, even how... Indian Americans and our eyes are represented or, or, or um, kind of portrayed in the Desi industry, right? Um, I hear this very often, like in films, they'll show the guy like pulling up in like a Lexus and a Beamer and like a, you know, like, and he wears like all this like, you know, branded stuff or Rolls Royce, like, and, and I'm just like, listen, I drive a Honda Civic. Like, let me keep it real with you. Like, you know what I mean? And, and I think there's this disconnect that happens there where I don't feel represented being this Indian identity, but in, in that Indian industry. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also kind of want to add here to, to what Maida was saying when it comes to representation, right? Um, in, in the American industry or like how they see people are seen. And of course, relatability is the first and foremost thing. I really sit and wonder, like, how are they coming up with these narratives? Like, how are they coming up with these stories? Because I feel like there's not a soul that I know. <laughs> and don't, please, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I ain't ever met a Daisy like the ones they show in some of these, like, TV shows and things like that. So, okay, so the research. I think Maeva, yeah, Maeva can comment on this because we actually, she wrote an article about something, like, who is writing these stories, right? Like, who is writing it? So, Maeva, do you want to, Take us on the journey of Spin. Yeah. So first, let's tell people what Spin is. Okay, so Spin was a movie that I think premiered last month or two months ago. And it's a story about an Indian American girl, and she works in her dad's Indian restaurant. And the dad's really Uncle Dale. The, the dad's, dad's Uncle Dale. Dale. Yes. I got to talk to him. He's super chill. Um, but... Uh, she basically has like a passion for music, but it's also doing coding on the side. She's the coding captain of her high school. Yes, you. I can see that look. I know. This is this I is know. a Disney film. I don't know if you mentioned yeah. this is a Dis Disney. It's a Disney film. film. Yeah. <laughs> and there was, uh, and they were advertising it as like, oh, it's the first Disney Channel like uh, Indian American movie. Like, yay. Um, 
But while I was watching it, I was like, okay, so there are so many things that's wrong with this movie. And let's break it that, down. Let's break down yeah, exactly it, it's why it's wrong. Like a mask. No, let's start with number one. The fact that they, uh, let's start with the holy thing, right? Oh, so in the um, movie, there was, uh, she puts on like a holy dance uh, during holy, I think. Uh, and, and when she says dance, it's like a, like a school dance, not like a dance like a, dance. Yeah, it's <laughs> oh, a school okay. dance. Okay. And from what I could see, there was, she was the only Indian kid in her, like, whole, in her high school. And she was the only one there, and she was just like, yeah, I think it would be really nice to make a holy dance. And they call it the Festival of Color, which, it's not a big thing for me, but it's still a thing that ticks me off. Just, like, if you're going to call it, uh, if you're going to have a dance like this, you might as well just call it by its name. Um, I understand that they might have wanted to reach out to, like, American audience or the mainstream audiences. So they didn't call but, it, they didn't call it the holy dance? No, they called it the Festival of Color dance. Like, it's, like, people what? just throwing color with no understanding of, like, the background or mythology. Yeah. Oh. So yeah. they didn't explain none of that? No, no, no. They only wore white clothes. Um, they had music, but this is going to sound like a problem in itself. The music was played by, in the movie, a British-American DJ. Hmm. Yeah, that, that feels like a problem in itself. She's the but, only Indian person, and she's supposedly a DJ, but the white guy is playing the music. Yeah. A British white guy is playing the British music. white guy. <laughs> also, they have uh, her wearing... Can we talk about how she wears gortas everywhere, like, in the in the, in the movie? Yeah. In the movie, she just wears gortas everywhere. At some point, it's like, yeah, I get it. She's working at her dad's restaurant. Maybe she needs to go there right afterwards. But at some point, she just goes home wearing it. and uh, Or goes and, to school. She goes, goes to, to school, school wearing it. She goes it, yeah. to school wearing it. And while you have your freedom of what you want to wear and stuff like that, I'm not going to judge you for it. But if you want to, like, actually represent Indian Americans, most of us don't wear our groceries to school. Like, if I have a Gattak lesson right after that, yeah, sure, I'm going to wear a groceries to school just so that I don't have to go home and change. But I'm not going to go to school wearing a Gurti just because I feel like wearing a Gurti. Yeah. <laughs> I'm because like the one Indian exception. I'm the one girl who wore so like to no. college. <laughs> yes, you I think we do, but it's like <laughs> that's not accurate to like a middle school or a high school yeah. student, right? Like growing up, I was in this I was really in especially. Is yeah, exactly. The the TikTok generation where everyone's wearing like crop tops and like God knows what oh, like they're not gonna <laughs> no I mean it's just like it, it's not reasonable to expect like I, I would if I was trying to be cool in high school I wouldn't wear a kurta to school now I don't care what people think so I wear whatever I want but like you know like the social and I would expectations even, like, if they wanted to bring that like desi touch to it I would have at least been happy like if they showed her wearing normal clothes but like maybe with a bindi because I know a lot of kids do do that that they wear the bindi yeah. they, like a little one that they that they wear and they go to school like or know, earrings or yeah, earrings. earrings. Yeah, right. right. But yeah, I think that's I, that's where that's where it's like you're trying so hard to do something that is not real to our experience, right? Like yeah. I did kathak all of high school. I I was very involved in the Indian community. I did not work with at a school. Yeah, not once. Also, Indian yeah. American teens are still teens. They still follow the same things other teens follow. They're gonna probably like a lot of the things other teens follow. So mm -hmm. if you're gonna and when I talked to the director, she said, I didn't want her to become completely westernized. I didn't want her to be, like, completely this, like, American western girl. I wanted to have some Indian touch as well. Well, yeah, director's that's a good reason. Indian or director's? D director's Indian. I, we're getting to the part where it's going to start to become a problem in the production team. But um, that's not the right way to approach that situation. Like, yes, you don't want her to be completely Western. She's not completely Western. She's Indian American. In the Indian part still has to be a part of her identity. But making her work good thus to school is not a good way to solve that. Like, maybe, like, you could show her watching a Bollywood film in her living room. Just, like, maybe there's some touches to her bedroom that's, like, maybe she has, like, a statue of a god there. Or, like, whatever religion she follows. Mm, yeah. Like, that's that but yeah, so the director definitely tried to, like, Mela asked these questions to the director. I was there when she was asking them. And, or, I, 
I was I saw the interview basically and like yeah. the director tried to like claim that you know making it so like making it universal making it socially acceptable by like doing these things like making her wear a corta or like calling it the festival of colors it like normalizes it you it's a universal thing and it was like what you're doing is diminishing our our culture and our religion to make it palatable to the western audience when if your whole point is to cater to the indian american audience then cater to the indian american audience and don't do that but the kicker here is that who are the writers for this film meta they are both white people so let me okay 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 <laughs> okay hold up let me process this real quick So you have a director who's this, who's trying to make this like a happy space for everybody. And mm-hmm. then you have two white writers. So the script is already biased. If this the whole thing is if the writers room is white, it doesn't matter who your directors are, who your actors are. The entire thing is already written from a from a western narrative and then you're just and, So what is okay, a and for our viewers and and we want you know we want our viewers to also to happen with this conversation it's quite interesting. What I want to know is like let's just let's just break this down. Let's be very pragmatic, right? What is the mm-hmm. role of a director? What is the role of a writer? The director is supposed to direct what the writers wrote. It's <laughs> exactly. in the names of the jobs. <laughs> and the, the thing that just got me the most mad when I was talking to the director was when I said like wait why was a white person writing this film she was like well they had a lot of input from me and then she said there were some mosas in the writing room and i'm like are you expecting the samosas to give off the indian energy to make them indian all of a sudden maybe inject <laughs> melanin in their skin just like <laughs> you know what i want uh... to know i want to know also like you know as far as the writers are concerned right does this mean that this idea was theirs or this idea someone else's and they just write the story i so that that that's really unclear right meetha i yeah. feel like it she said the script it, went through many incarnations but wasn't very clear on who wrote it incarnations <laughs> yeah cuz that that would be my that would be my like thing like if this was originally born out of one of the writers i would have like I'm already pissed but I would be even more pissed but like yeah. if this was like someone some the they see I think it was it. here's here's what I think happened I I do think the writers from what we what we read was that they yeah. wrote the the whole thing like they had this idea and they wrote it and basically like d- d- it can be two ways that you go about or maybe three right like Disney comes up with an idea and then they find writers to implement yeah. it they're like we have this idea we want Indian Americans and can you write it The second can can be that they pitched the idea to them. They already had the idea and they came to them. And the third could be that they were like writing under the direction of somebody else, but there's nobody else listed. So, yeah. I mean, the only in- unfortunately, they did this band-aid cover-up where it was like the director's Indian, all of the all of the cast, a lot of the cast like the main actors were Indian except for like wait, the friends wait. in the school. No, I I actually think that a lot of the teenagers in the film were not Indian. Like, yes, yeah, she had the Indian family outside of school, but mm-hmm. it would have been nice in my opinion to have like another Indian friend. Maybe she could talk about some of the problems in the high school with. Like, already I can lit I've been in high school for 3 months and I can list like 10 <laughs> problems being an Indian American. Like off the top of my head. And I feel like having another Indian American just to like talk and have like a conversation and to start a conversation about what it really means to be Indian in a white community. I feel like that would have been so heartfelt and so just beautiful to have in a Disney film of all films. Mm-hmm. And just having like those conversations that are tough but still like making it a kids movie because kids can take it honestly. Yeah. Like yeah. Lizzie McGuire. Lizzie McGuire had the best friends ever. Like that one girl and the one guy. Mm-hmm. I would have loved maybe to see this like Daisy girl who has this Daisy girl friend and a Daisy boy who's a friend or something like that too. And I want to also say this. Um Daisy people click with Daisy people. Like come on. Yeah. Like, yeah. like Daisy We're all here. Daisy. Before yeah. Daisy yeah. people like wouldn't like I don't like the fact that this one Daisy kid is the only Daisy kid in the school. Now, I don't know if that's 
if the whole movie was about her being the only Indian kid in her school or if the movie was just about this person's life. Like, I don't know what the, 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 the narrative is, but, like, uh, I don't know. I also remember in the film, the person organizing that festival of colored dance was white. It, her name was literally Ginger. Her name what? was literally Ginger. It was, name was Ginger. it wasn't even the main character? No, she she just said, I thought it would be a great idea to have a holy dance. And then the next fil- uh, the next scene was just Ginger showing her a website she made of holy and her saying, that sounds great. And it was the most stereotypically Indian website that you could have ever and created. You know, I have a problem with this. I have a problem with this for a couple of reasons. First is because it's showing, again, this complex, right? This like, oh, well, don't worry. White man is there to save us. Don't worry. Like, I'm here. I got mm-hmm. you, friend. Oh, you brown? Don't worry, friend. I got you. Holy. I can I can do that for you. You're brown. Let's represent you by doing your thing. <laughs> Let's right. do that. And, and I especially don't <laughs> like because it is a white person who's playing the savior. Who's mm-hmm. playing the, I'm, I got, I'm She like, can advocate for herself, right? She's the oh. protagonist. Oh, another thing about the movie, which is White Savior. So there is this big DJ competition the movie is hyping up onto. And the British dude, um, he sort of takes all of her work and he credits it as his work. Um, And he just becomes the villain of the story from that point on. And then her friends enroll her in the DJ competition and say, you have to do it. You're such a good DJ artist. And it would just sound so much better if she did herself. Because that would have been her character development. Her it's not agency. Her forcing her. Yeah. yeah her they're, agency. They're basically making her like a passive voice, a passive actor in her own life by having other people do things for her. Because Asian Americans can't do anything for themselves. Yeah. People nope. have to tell them what to do. No, I definitely, that, that pisses savior, me off. I hate that savior thing. Like, I hate that oh narrative because... I think it's 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 not even about like that the American person has to do it. It's kind of like in a in a subliminal way sending the message that well we we will tell you what to do mm-hmm. and you and we'll, oh. take, we'll yeah. take parts of your culture we think are cool and interesting yeah. and use them in the ways that we want and then everything else we don't care. Like we don't care to understand, we don't care to like actually like how many people have I said have told me India's dirty. Like, how many people say India's, you know, like, you say whatever you want, and then you can just take what you want. So that's, that's really the message that that film was giving us. It, and also, she doesn't she fall in love or like or whatever with yeah, that the British, British DJ yeah. who stole her music, and they, he never apologizes to her, which is, oh, so we should just accept the British for all the fucked up shit that they well, did. <laughs> yeah. Well, they did I one scene at the end. Far. <laughs> they did one scene at the end of the movie where, like, she's celebrating, and he's, like, he was second place, and he's, like, he just stares into her eyes like this and like they she stares back and they share a nod and that's it that's it that's the only apology we get so yeah yeah how does that make you feel <laughs> eye contact I, apologies considering that this is a daisy i'm not daisy but disney film like shit like that okay i can tolerate like the little like you know the eyes lock and then they just go thanks dude like i get that <laughs> that's just the disney feel good movie feel I just don't like some of these things that I'm hearing, especially this, like, this, the savior thing. I think that's the thing that pissed me off the most. But also, like, the writers. Why? There are tons of Indian writers. Why did you make a Disney film written by white people for Indian people? That's literally the craziest thing I've ever heard. And and, and I don't think at this point, I'm just like, no, this movie wasn't about Indian people or trying to represent them. This was about the the white person trying to save the brown person. And That's even with the music in itself, um, it's like her whole thing is just, she's a DJ who blends Indian sounds and uh, American sounds. They did not go into detail on that at all. I would have loved to see, like, maybe she has, like, uh, Indian friends who play tabla or Indian friends who play sitar. And maybe, like, she has them all in a room and that's how she incorporates the styles. Mm-hmm. But we just go have a montage of her looking at files on her computer and just bunching them together and then suddenly she has a finished product and it's amazing and everyone has a standing ovation 
But if you're going to talk about Indian music to a mainstream audience, then a lot of people don't know what Indian music is. They just kind of um, see that, like, it's like they think of Bollywood music straight off the, like, not even like normal Bollywood music, like stereotypical Bollywood music. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you need to go in depth on that more. It can't mm-hmm. just be like, oh, she's blending in India. I know. I hear what you're saying. Like, it's like you chose to highlight the musical mm-hmm. element of Indian culture, but then you didn't actually talk about Indian music at all. And you just kind of, you know, utilized whatever you thought sounded kind of Indian, which is really <laughs> shitty. I want to move past spin because I actually do also want to talk yeah. about like, maybe never have I ever or mm-hmm. other things that you've been watching. So I don't know, like, what did you, like, what did both of you think about Never Have I Ever? I know, I think, yes, you didn't like it. I can't remember. I don't, I don't know, Never, I don't know either, either of these. So this is great perspective for me. Mm, okay. So, yes, yeah. you, you watch Never Have I Ever, right? This is the Mindy Kaling show that everyone's, like, so pumped yeah. about. I watched the Mindy Kaling show, but I don't think I watched Never Have I Ever. Oh, so what do you think, Meta? Oh, illuminate us. Let me. Check. It was kind. There were parts of it that were good, and there were parts of it that were kind of like, eh. I'm not so <laughs> fond of that. Never mind. One of the things I was fond about, which a lot of people don't, um, they don't like about Never Have I Ever, is Melanie or the mom in the story, mm-hmm. because she's a. We both share Thumb of moms, and <laughs> I will say there were some moments where I was like, yeah. That's a double mom. And, uh, <laughs> but there were some moments where I was like, yeah, my double mom would really care much about me going out with a boy or something like that. Like, yeah, she's not just this vigilante, no boys allowed sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And I feel that's also very much a stereotype of Indian Americans that they're like studies and nothing else. You can't have boyfriends, girlfriends, like whatever. And, and there were some parts of the film that I liked, like, I liked the episode during Ganesh Chaturthi where the, Devi kind of went there and she was like, well, I think this is just a dumb Indian thing that I have to go to. But then she meets up with one of her like close friends and he's like, yeah, I really learned to appreciate what Ganesh Chaturthi really means. It's hanging out with the family and the community that I love. And mm-hmm. that was a great episode. But there have been some moments where I was like, okay, got to tone down on the like what you went through in the 90s your personal experience Mindy Kaling like well I think she just likes to capitalize on like boys and liking and sex and she really always does that but it is nice to hear like the because I also I couldn't really get through most of Never Have I Ever so I just stopped watching I'm also like not a teen so it's like really hard to watch a teen show like that um so I didn't know if it was my age or if it was like the actual cultural context. I know I don't like that the Richa uh, Shukla who plays like the this um, her cousin has an Indian yeah. accent, but she's an Indian American uh, from yeah. the Bay Area who I know doesn't have an Indian accent. Yeah. So I'm like, why did you make her have an Indian accent? And also most people from India don't have that Indian accent that, that she yeah. plays. I'm like, this is just wrong. So her again, accent is like, uh, her accent is like, I can't pull it off. I'm too curvaceous. And I'm like, okay, okay. No, yeah, tone like that down. Curvaceous. Tone that down. Curvaceous. Maybe that yeah. much. But it ain't yeah. curvaceous. <laughs> okay. Like, <laughs> I yeah. will say, like, like my accent. mom, who lived in India for 20 years of her life, doesn't have that Indian accent that she has. Yeah. That's the, that's the truth. So, yeah, what I were you going to say about the mini project? Yeah, the Mindy Project. So the Mindy Project was a TV series. Now that's the one I watch where Mindy plays Mindy, this like Mm -hmm. Indian. uh, I've seen the Mindy Project. Yeah. Yeah. But that was one that um, I felt was like, maybe more closer to a little bit to, to like being an Indian American person growing up in New York City. And you know, you had you're like, you know, it's more like career oriented and whatnot. But I felt like that one did not at all talk about her Indian heritage. Um, Barely. But before, before, you know, um, I forget, I kind of want to also throw this in there because we're talking about media. And for those of you who are, you know, tapping into our live today, we're talking about South Asian representation in media. I want to talk about the reality show, Family <laughs> Karma. 
I haven't oh, heard of that one. Okay, so basically, it's like Keeping Up with the Kardashians, um, mm -hmm. Housewives of whatever, whatever. <laughs> Beverly Hills, New York, like right, all of those ones. Indian version, and literally the the here's the the. Oh, I think I've heard of this one. Yeah. Family Karma is an American reality television series that premiered in 2020 and airs on Bravo. It chronicles the lives of sev several Indian American families over three generations who relocated to Miami, Florida around the same time. And yeah, I, I kind of want to know, you know, your whole thought process behind having a show like this and media <laughs> I am confused with that I, like is it like is it like Kardashian rich families yeah like, yeah like very rich Indian Americans I'm gonna oh. a picture real quick I'm gonna flip my camera and then just show you guys a quick picture of like what it looks like oh god it's like Sorry. one of those like Bravo TV shows, right? Like classic. Do they all like? Are they from all sort all parts of India? Like, or is it just like Punjab, Gujarat, or sorts of area? I so think they're all Gujarati. It seemed like, right? Oh. Yeah, I believe, or or something like that. I don't think there was um, any South Indian representation. Well, I'm half North Indian and I'm half South Indian. My dad's from Kolkata. My mom's from Bombay. So having, I have a little, I have my toes dipped into both sides of the pool. So I've always wanted to see more South Indian representation. That's one of my, what, like when I see a character in, the, uh, in a film who's South Asian Indian, I'm just like, yes, we got something, guys. Like, we finally have a character who's South Indian. But then, like, if they, they just disappoint all the time. They're just, like, either hyper-religious or speak with a really strong Tamil accent and, like, bob their heads up and down like this. Are you talking, what are you talking in reference to? Like, movies, m shows? Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Probably movies. Okay, but, so so in terms of the question that Yeshu asked, like, what yeah. do you think about the idea of even having a reality show like Kim Kardashian's oh, yeah. with Indians in it? Like, what do you think about that? Is that the danger zone? The danger zone for that is going into stereotypes. If you're gonna have a reality show based solely on Indian Americans because of their race, then stereotypes are gonna—they're gonna try to get in, and. It's the problem is when you don't do anything to stop that or counter that. Mm -hmm. Because, like, the Kardashians, like, their troubles are just, like, well, you stole my eyeliner. And, like, mm -hmm. you wore the same thing as me today. And when, when it, your theme is Indian Americans, you're going into, like, a very, very touchy zone of, like, oh, you got a better grade than me on this test. Or, oh, my God, my gurta is, like, weird. And, like... It's just yeah, we don't know, like, we. Uh, here's my take on representation, since I didn't give it yet. So, like, I think that it it actually is good that you have so many different types of, res you know, like, representation, like you said, you want to see a South Indian, I want to see a Bihari, she wants to see someone that speaks Telugu. Like, there's all these different things that we all seek, and the only way to get them is to have more of it, right? The more you have, even if initially you know even if it doesn't all speak to us i think having so much of it will at, ultimately at some point some of it will speak to us like mm -hmm. i really liked um aziz ansari's show modern uh romance is that no master of none mm -hmm. master of none oh. i think did like a pretty good job of trying to talk about some of the things that, of like just identity um but maybe that might not resonate with everybody right like some 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 Indian women growing up were boy crazy and some weren't. Some were Tamil and some weren't. Some were, you know, so I feel like the more that we have, some were Gujarati, like maybe all these rich, you know, seeing rich Indians is also nice, but seeing like normal people is also nice. I think it's like, can we get all of that? And I think that can only I think, come. Mm -hmm. I think, um, Lily Singh. I think Lily Singh, oh. and I've been her from the get-go when she was just, you know, I think. Yeah, Superwoman high school yeah like i i had i had seen her like first video all the way to like where she is at now and i felt like i 
I, I guess I later disconnected with her after she started to really become famous because I felt yeah. like it was started to become really cheesy. Overproduced, right? Overproduced. And then suddenly these yeah. people in these clips like she was doing a great job by herself the minute she started yeah. having these white people come in and play these other characters part of her skit yeah i lost interest i was like this is not this isn't speaking you know yeshu you and i are the same generation of youtube because that was when there was like hype weird indian stuff on youtube like there was luda krishna who was ludicrous <laughs> with vikram mc do you remember this i mean some of it was some of it was like really like probably not palatable to like the normal person but lily singh came out of that she came out of that generation of like weird indian american culture on youtube where it was really catered to us like there was nobody else watching it was for us but then as soon as it became generic that's when we i also agree with you because mm -hmm. i stopped watching her right after call like around my college years like after that she started to get like more and more famous because she was doing college rounds like i saw her in college come to our college campus and then mm -hmm. and then she like started to blow up and then she was like in you know inviting all these different people on to her yeah. sk skits and that's when i also stopped watching her but like it's it's nice to think that there was a subculture on youtube that we both know <laughs> to be yeah true, and, but made that uh, you'll never know <laughs> oh, oh i watched uh, lily sing like old lily sing yeah i for for a while i did watch like only old lily sing i didn't really go into her like her later stuff but i think i was like a really big fan of yes there's an indian person who understands me and um but around the time I think when she got her show, because she got a show, it was like the uh, late, late, uh, late show with Lily Singh or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I started to lose a little bit of interest. But one of the things that piqued my interest a little bit was that growing at that time was that she just came out as bisexual. And at that time, I was questioning, and now I've come out as bisexual. Mm -hmm. So it. I got to relate to her and see, like, well, there's a person who's kind of like me there. Mm -hmm. And the more she talked about LGBTQ issues, I was still, like, hooked onto that because I was just trying to figure out, like, who I was at the moment. And This is a really segue to why representation matters, because yeah. you were able to relate to somebody based off of, like, you know, just, like, even their I different identities beyond just being South Asian. And I think that's so yeah. important because... We wouldn't have that. I mean, like, that's so, I mean, first of all, I'm proud of you for coming out and saying it on a live is also big, but also like being able to like have those conversations with your family can only happen when you see how other people, like, yeah. you have some idea of how other people would deal with it. And um, I definitely did. I don't think we had that growing up. So it's like really nice to see that you were empowered by somebody. Yes, yes, you. <laughs> I have so much to say. Like, I also kind of, before we have to log off, talk up really briefly, because media, music as well. Representation of daisies in music industry, right? We have Raju Kumari, and we have, like, mm -hmm. people like that. Um, but then... Tesher just recently got really big, right? Who? Yeah. Tesher. Tesher. <laughs> Jalebi baby man. <laughs> Jalebi baby man. <laughs> but I want to I wanna give a shout-out to a kid I grew up with, and I cannot believe this. Right. And there's an article that I'm going to pull up right here. But Indian American songwriter and Arjun Ivaturi receives his first Grammy nomination. And I grew up with this kid. Like we literally I grew up with this kid. Like, wow. We went to the same part, like, you know, they see parties. We went to Temple together. He, I think we were singing buddies or something like we grew up together. And like and, and to see like that this kid right now, you know, has what done is he getting a Grammy for? His uh, his song, the song is written by Ava Turi along with Alicia Cara um, Khalid and then Sir Robert Bryson Hall. So like I didn't even know that my fellow University of Maryland graduate, my, you know, the kid I grew up with, like we were literally like little babies, like we grew up together, made it this far. And then again, you don't really hear names like this, you know, popping up as much, but we have mm -hmm. talent. Um, in the they see music industry, I, and I feel mm -hmm. like representation again. Media covers a lot of this, but I want to see rep, you know even representation in 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 media is important. In fact, um, for the show um, uh, by Nick Cannon, um, 
where he does his MTV. America's Got Talent? That mm-hmm. one? Max no, Singer? No, no, no. His his rap show. Do you guys have an idea? Oh, no. I don't know about it. Go no. on. Go on. <laughs> okay, yeah. So Nick Cannon um, has, a, has a, like, rap show that he does, like, where he does, like, rap battles um, and, and things like that. And it's called Wild and Out. Um, and oh, I, I watched I, that. I thought you were talking about the – that's an old show. Does that still exist? It still runs. I watch every episode. <laughs> Oh but, my god! I used to watch it back in the day. Okay, I didn't realize it's still going. So, anyways, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Right, and we actually had a a Indian, um, I believe a Indian, and I'm not sure if he was Telugu or not, but I'm pretty sure he was um, rapper actually in the rap battle, like on stage, like he was on a team. Wow. You know, they were they were doing his like he was doing his segment, and like you'll only see that little tiny snippet. For like thirty seconds, you'll like never really see it again. People don't really know this man. I think his name was Ram or Ram Kumar or something. If I remember correctly, I could be totally wrong. But um, but just knowing that you know you had this Daisy representation again, music industry, but you're not really seeing it. Um, so I think that's also something that you know I want to know. Like, how do you guys feel about Indian representation or Daisy representation? My bad, Daisy representation in the music industry. I always think it's great to see Desi representation, especially when there are Desi sounds involved. And, like, it's just, like, a Desi fusion. I love Desi fusion. It's, like, sometimes I'll just sit down and I'll just search Desi fusion and I'll just listen to it, like, for an hour and I'll just be like, yes, Indian American <laughs> me is happy. But I also remember, like, when I was, like, really young, I think I was, like, when I was five and six, the representation I knew was Selena Gomez dressing up in a sari and a bindi. And I was like, yes, that's Indian music. <laughs> and then my mom had to tell my mom had to tell me, like, no, she's not Indian. And I was like, she's not? And I, I got so disappointed then because I was like, well, where are the Indian artists in my mm-hmm. we- in Western? I was disappointed in that Coldplay Beyonce collab where they're like doing holy in India and I was oh. just so sad that happened because Bay is queen, and but in that moment she was not queen. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, you say like you don't know what I'm talking about, but well, yeah, the, when yeah when that happened, I was like, here is the issue with South Asian representation is that we can't co-opt it. Yeah, you can't you can't be like I don't care if you're another minority or not. Don't co-opt the culture for yourself. Like make it so that if you do include. Um, you know, you utilize them. I think, like, the Beatles kind of did that with um, Ravi Shankar, where they had him play. Like, okay, yeah. you're adding Indian music, but you're actually having him play. That's a pretty good way to, to like, include and not co-opt or uh, appropriate. And, and sorry, are, do you have something to say? Sorry, yes. Clearly, this topic is getting me very involved, and I apologize. But I, I think, you know, cultural appropriation is also something that is, like, kind of we we have been talking about it but we really ha- like you know we haven't actually used that terminology but i think cultural appropriation is something that definitely needs to be really defined when it comes to media and like really being able to cuz i get it a lot being a model i get it so much when say i have like this african american uh, or 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 i had this like caribbean um black creative director who wanted to do cornrow braids on me and then infuse that with like Indian tribal vibes and everything and in my head I'm sitting there like wait a minute is this wrong like is what I'm doing wrong you know and so like even being able to define what cultural appropriation is or for example I'm doing this fashion show right where it's like Mm -hmm. um anime kawaii so I'm bringing a lot of elements of like Japanese streetwear um and then references to anime and yesterday we were like okay for the final act should we like you know one of the one of the characters has um you know has affiliations with this um dragon like you know or whatever like would it be cool if i had people painted like dragons and then like you know because i'm making this into a production and then i i know one of my models said that's cultural appropriation and in a moment i'm like in a creative space i'm like huh like what it what how does that look like how can i well the thing about cultural appropriation is it, definitely I like that you're saying in media, like having defined guidelines. The thing is, like, obviously, it's every person will have a different opinion on it, which is why cultural appropriation is so like up in the air as like a conversation topic, because everyone will define it differently and everyone will have like different thresholds for what's OK to do. 
And I think with like specifically like music, since we were talking about music, I think I think when it comes to minority communities being integrated into things like this, you have to recognize because those people aren't like mainstream, not a lot of people know about these things. You have to do it in a way where you're giving back to that community, right? Like either mm -hmm. using that person or, or um, paying them for their work. Like all these things are part as an artist, you must know, like the, a big part of being an artist is getting paid for your work because people will consistently try to use your work without paying you. So I think like, so I I have actually like going back to the music. Um, I also love listening to all different types of music. And recently, I so as an India Currents member, what I really love is that I am always like being exposed to all the different stuff that's happening in the Indian and Desi community. So um, I found this uh, Indian jazz person where he infuses music of like like Indian music with like jazz influence. His name is Shubh oh, Sarhan. Really yes, yeah. I, I think, What's I don't it? think I did because his, his album just came out. It's called English, I-N-G-L-I-S-H. I feel like I'm plugging things, but this is like a really <laughs> great name? album. Huh? What's his name again? Shubh Saran, S-H-U-B-H and um, space S-A-R-A-N. And it is like so like when you talk about the intricacies of jazz and then the intricacies of classical music, I mean, it's not like he's not there's no singing. There's not none of that. It's like instrumental completely. But it is so like it's such a good blend of of those two cultures. And he's using, you know, influences that he's getting from other people and he's including them. And then he's using his own influences to like create something new, a new sound. And I think. There are definitely ways. And I really like that you brought up cultural appropriation because I do agree. Like there, I think whenever someone tells you, hey, this feels like cultural appropriation, you just listen. That's really what it is, right? This person said it to you and then you were like, oh, hey, let me take a step back. Let me not dress someone like a dragon because that is cultural appropriation. So if anyone of you has any questions about what is appropriate, ask any of us and someone will have an idea of what they think is right. And maybe then you can kind of like, go forward with that i think we should probably close out our chat right now because we're at an hour um oh this god is really, yeah we're, we did a full hour um i would like to end on this note though i think no matter what media platform it is or like what form of media whatever it is i think it all boils down to intention and then with intention uh, you're going to be able to like if you're truly trying to if your intention is representation and it's not something else then you're i feel like that should be your concentration right and if your intention is respecting different form other cultures in your thing then that should be your intention so i feel like that would be as a creative myself I think that's what it ultimately boils down to. Like, if, you're, if your aim, especially if you're a director or something, and your aim was to be more inclusive of brown people, then do your research. Make sure you are actually meeting that criteria. And yeah, not talk to them. Bring them into the yeah. writer's room. Bring them into every space. Don't make it so that they're just, like, the forward-facing token, right? Like, you include them in all spaces. And... Let's let Medha and close us out because Yashu and I have <laughs> talked quite a bit. One, <laughs> tell me, do you have any last statements? And then two, tell me your favorite um, Daisy song and I'll play it. So we'll we'll <laughs> close out to that song. So yeah, last statements. Okay, so I loved what Yashu said. Like, what is your intention? Because when you go behind a lot of TV shows or movies, especially in, like, Western cinema, you can tell the intention is the Indians to be the butt of the joke. Like, have you guys watched Big Bang Theory? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Oh, my <laughs> God. I'm pretty sure the inclusion of Rods was just so that they could have an Indian butt of the joke. There was no reason why he had to have that thick of an Indian accent, why he couldn't talk to women, why he was just, like, a complete nerd. Oh, and Maybe we could keep going, but honestly, yeah. we're going to get cut out on Instagram. So tell me, is that your last thing? What do you want to say? What do you want to leave people so with? So I think I really want to leave people with, we are there to talk to you if you need to know anything. And I feel like a lot of people are scared to ask or scared to like say like, oh, am I being too touchy on it? Am I going to like offend uh, them? Like, 
But honestly, our job in the creative industry, especially when it's about Indian American or Indian films, is to help you and give that sort of spotlight mm -hmm. on to what it should be and what how it will it will make a true representation. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not going to be perfect, but it's a step forward if we have a voice in this conversation. Awesome. And Mic drop. And also, what is your favorite song? I'm going to play it. Oh, God. Um, I'm going to say, um, this is a total masala film, but Om Shanti Om, um, I think. <laughs> which song? Boom Tana? I, my head was like Om Shanti Om. Is it Boom Tana or which one? I I think it was like the... Oh, I think it's like the... Oh, Shanti Om. It's, the, it's the main one. Okay, Om Shanti Yeah, yeah the Om. Main. Okay, here we uh, go. I grew up on that movie. <laughs> All right, let's see. This, this the intro is long. I'm gonna kind of go forward yeah, here. Yeah. Go to the meaty part. Yeah. I wonder if our lives didn't post because we had the music. How could they know that? They have sensors. If you put music, <laughs> let's post. Maybe. But we jam it anyway. <laughs> Our dances are very different. <laughs> <laughs> You're just trying to <laughs> booty shake. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this has been real. Thanks, that was a long everybody. Long, just to let you know, it's yeah. six minutes yeah. long. That was the wrong. That was Dhuwanga. That was in Dhuwangi. Dhuwangi. Oh wait. I clicked the wrong one. I clicked. I thought I clicked Om Shanti Om. Oh my God. Okay, give me a sec. <laughs> I can't believe this happened. Okay, Technical wait. difficulties. We've clicked the wrong song. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I tried my best. They don't even have the main one. It's probably called Diwangi Diwangi. Yeah, called... it is. You're right. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Yeah, there it is. So she just wanted to play what she wanted to play. I just wanted to play. <laughs> Selective hearing at its finest. <laughs> okay, well, should we scroll up? I'm gonna. Put your hand in oh, Okay, we did them both. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. See you next week. Bye.